Hello and welcome back to The Cinephiles, where this week we conclude our exploration of Patty Chayefsky's network with special guest Warren Olney. At the end of part one, we were still reeling from the power, poetry, and prescience of Howard Beale shouting into that TV camera, telling us we've got to get mad. I don't want you to protest. I don't want you to ride. I don't want you to write to your congressman because I wouldn't know what to tell you to write. I don't know what to do about the depression and the inflation and the Russians and the crime in the street. All I know is that first, you've got to get mad. You've got to say, I'm a human being. God damn it. My life has value. It's a remarkable sequence. One of the great in film. And we're still using that line. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. A lot of people who never saw the movie don't know where it came from. Right. I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take this anymore. And a little thing about how it was shot. So they sit down to do it. Take one was excellent. Finch did the whole thing. And he built to such an intensity by the end of the scene um, that Lumet did a really unusual thing as a director. So frequently, if you're directing, let's say you're doing an insert. Let's say I'm going to pick up this bottle. You might say to the actor, okay, let's, let's roll camera action. The actor picks up the bottle and the director will say, don't cut. Uh, go back to one, which means put the bottle back down and let's do it again. Okay. Okay. Don't cut. And you do it like three times because it takes every time you cut, then you have to start over and you have to say roll camera and you get a slate and all this stuff takes a long time. And you're like, this is really easy. Let's do it. But you don't normally do that with performance because you don't just start over a whole scene, but that's exactly what Sidney Lumet Hmm. did. Finch gets to the end of this huge monologue, hugely intense, energy intensive monologue. And he says, don't cut back to one. Finch, let's, uh, Peter, let's start right again. And Peter Finch is shocked and stunned. You know, like I have to right away, I have to go start this right away. And the reason that Lumet did it is that he felt that the energy, the intensity that he had built to at the end of the scene was what he wanted at the beginning of the scene. Huh. So he didn't want him to drop his energy down. So Peter Finch gets back to the desk, immediately starts up again, gets about halfway through the, the monologue and stops and says, I'm sorry, Sydney. I'm I'm exhausted. I can't I can't keep going. I can't do it anymore. He, he complete. It's like a sprinter had gone back. You know, he mm-hmm. did the four, you know the four hundred and then went back and got two hundred meters and went. I'm that's it. And Sydney goes, that's okay. And that's all they did. Mm-hmm. One and a half takes is all they ever did of this whole thing. What you see for the first half of the scene is the first half of take two <laughs> before he stopped, and the second half of the scene is take one. Wow. And what nobody knew at the time at all on the set was that Peter Finch had a major heart condition Mm. and that he was in fact quite sick throughout the entire shoot. And you think about this person, this brilliant actor, literally leaving it all on the court, you know, like he puts, and you could watch this performance and you could see it is everything this human has. Oh yeah. And of course, uh, Peter Finch died slightly after making this film, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and I just think that is, that's the way to go out, you know? He just did it. He put every single thing he had into it until he had nothing more. He did one and a half takes. One of the greatest mm. speeches of all time did it one and a half times. Wow. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah. Did did they have cue cards or anything of that kind? Or did he have to learn the whole thing? And, they learned and, the whole thing. Yeah. I mean, he's a theater actor. And they sure. had, and they had yeah. three weeks of rehearsal. So, so yeah, he, uh, he they, they learned the whole thing. Yeah. Which for, you know, some of these, these are no joke speeches. So, mm-hmm. I mean, there's a lot Incredible to learn. Low. Yeah. With builds. But they're written so well mm-hmm. yeah. that it's easy to remember them because you know exactly where you're going sure. and what the language is and why it's there. Yeah. Uh, we're in L.A., which is actually shot on Long Beach <laughs> um, at, a, at a building. It's all in location. They never shot anything in a studio. And we have a meeting with uh, Lorraine Hobbs, who is the African-American head of the Communist Party. <laughs> She's a great character. And we have this meeting where now we're going to launch the Mao Zedong Hour, and we want the liberation, whatever they are, and the great Ahmed Khan to do these series of terrorist acts. And at, and at first, Lorraine Hobbs is going, hey, the Communist Party is too respectable to deal with these you know, hooligans. And... Uh, <laughs> And basically, it's like, look, you can come on the air. I'm giving you network television to say whatever you want. You just have to organize this thing. And we see how quickly the Communist Party is corrupted, too. And knows him. Oh, yeah. She totally knows the great Ahmed Khan. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And she shows up. It's all about image. Exactly. (laughs) Yep. And she shows up to the great Ahmed Khan at some safe house out in the middle of nowhere where he's eating a bucket of fried chicken. (laughs) And she says, Well, Ahmed, you ain't going to believe this. And I'm going to make a TV star out of you, just like Archie Bunker. 
what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> By the way, the great Amon Khan is a vegetarian. <laughs> so he had to eat fried chicken all day. <laughs> I just love that you're going to this liberation army that's eating corporate fried chicken, oh, yeah. Kentucky fried chicken. There's nothing... The irony of it. It's all lies. There's no... I even, mean... the, even the revolution is bullshit. <laughs> I was just going to say, life is bullshit. Yeah, I don't right. know if you had that's gotten the news report. Yeah. It was the revolution the is especially bullshit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> Um, and now let's go see the Howard Beale Show. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it. How do you feel? We're mad as hell, and we're not going to take this anymore. And things oh, have changed. This is so this great. This is a big production. Ladies and gentlemen, the Network News Hour with Sybil the Soothsayer. Jim Levick, and here sits the Emma's Truth Department. And we have a live studio audience and all these sort of little programs that sound totally ridiculous, except really today they're not that ridiculous. Well, and here's the deal, really, for those of you who are younger than, I don't know, 30, you have no idea of what TV was like. Variety hours were the standard. Carol yeah. Burnett. Oh, that's a great point. Carol Burnett, Dean Martin roasts. Uh, Donnie was, Marie. Donnie and... Marie. Buddy Hackett had a show. Uh, Flip I Wilson. Yeah. I love Lucy. Yeah, Lucio Ball, Flip Wilson. All these people had variety shows to try to make it work and try to be successful. There was comedy acts. Lawrence Welk did it for many, many years. Oh, yeah. And so this was, so to see something like this, you may think watching in 2019 or 2018, whenever you've seen the movie recently, like this is so weird, that would never happen. That's a fantasy. No, this, it looks very similar to what you'd see in a, rea in a, a, a variety show. Well, and if you watch CNN, what are they constantly doing? Adding showbiz technology right. to try to make all, we have big screens with yeah. maps and holograms and all right. that stuff. Up. The holograms coming up. I mean, yeah, it, it, it's all showbiz. Um, and it always was. And it interestingly, Walter Cronkite uh, was famous for saying, "You know, we just give you the headlines. That's all we've got." And it's effectively a performance that we are mm -hmm. doing. I mean, he was really he understood that I think in a, in a really important way. Uh, David Brinkley, who famous uh, anchorman for NBC said that, uh, this is in terms of the audience response to these guys, these anchor people, that he would get off the plane with a presidential candidate and he'd get a bigger hand than the candidate. Mm, right. And that concerned him. Mm. Um, and we have Howard Beale's first speech as a, you know, pretty much a latter-day mm. preacher on television yeah. um, talking about the tube. Because less than 3% of you people read books. Because less than 15% of you read newspapers. Because the only truth you know is what you get over this tube. Right now, there is a whole, an entire generation that never knew anything that didn't come out of this tube. This tube is the gospel, the ultimate revelation. This tube can make or break presidents, popes, prime ministers. This tube is the most awesome goddamn force in the whole godless world. So whatever you t we tell you is the truth. And that is pretty scary when the 12th largest corporation in the world, which is the CCA, buys the network. Hmm. This seems really <laughs> on the money. Yeah. Like, how can you trust what you hear? And then he says, Television is not the truth. Television is a goddamn amusement park. Television is a circus, a carnival, a traveling troupe of acrobats, storytellers, dancers, singers, jugglers, sideshow freaks, lion tamers, and football players. We're in the boredom killing business. That's really important. Mm. That's really the stuff. Mm. And he just goes off on it. Like, you know what you're going to see if you're in these talks. I love, I, I love, sometimes references to pop culture and movies make the movies seem dated. And for this, they're just perfect. Hmm. I love the references to Kojak and Archie Bunker and the Six Million Dollar Man. <laughs> Those are just, it just, and that this is a predictable thing. You know Kojak's going to get the guy in the end. You know this is all an illusion to show you what you want to hear. We'll tell you any shit you want to hear. We deal in illusions, man. None of it is true. But you people sit there day after day, night after night, all ages, colors, creeds. We're all you know. You're beginning to believe the illusions we're spinning here. You're beginning to think that the tube is reality and that your own lives are unreal. You do whatever the tube tells you. You dress like the tube. You ate like the tube. You raise your children like the tube. You even think like the tube. This is mass madness, you maniacs. In God's name, you people are the real thing. We are the illusion. 
So then he says, turn it off. Turn your TV off now. Turn it off. Turn it off right in the middle of my sentence. Turn it <laughs> off now. And then he faints. And this is the thing you were talking about. Yeah. There is a shot of his eyes in the moment before he faints where he is, it's clear it's fake to me. Yeah. That's what I see. He looks down before he fakes, before he faints. And, and goes like, is this the right moment to faint? Okay, I better do it now. Yeah. I totally think it's fake. I wonder. I wonder. You never see him uh, behind the scenes, like having a conversation of, here, I'm going to faint here. So right. make sure the camera comes up like and boy, this. boy, the camera pushes right in on him, yeah, and the yeah. audience erupts into a standing ovation with yeah. the producers going, stand up, stand up, stand up. Because even, even the truth teller is fake. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, the, you hit it. That's a very, very powerful moment. And the idea that he did it on purpose, that he was did it in a contrived way. Mm-hmm. Uh, says a lot. I hadn't. I didn't think of that. I have to tell you. I, that that's one I think that comes from watching it over and over. Yeah, and over that's again, really you know? that's really interesting. And we're having a board meeting with CCA, and we're in. This is actually shot. This is the long table with the green. It's perfect green lights on this long table. This is actually the boardroom of the New York Public Library. <laughs> And we hear about how successful the Howard Beale show is, and the camera moves down the 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 table past all the executives and finally settles on Mr. Jensen, the CEO of CCA, Ned Beatty. I totally forgot the name of this yeah. movie. <laughs> when he showed up, I was like, oh! Another great name in the, uh, in, yeah. the in the annals. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and we find out that uh, Ruddy, who was the CEO who had had the heart attack, maybe I didn't even mention it, you did. Uh, mm. He uh, he has passed away, mm. and uh, Faye is out near the funeral hailing a cab, and who walks up on this very windy day but Max Schumacher and offers to buy her a cup of coffee, to which her response is, hell yes. <laughs> and she says, oh, Howard says you're doing fine. And he says, nope. She's keeping busy, and he says, lots of funerals, friends in hospitals, occasional christenings. All my friends seem to be dying or having grandchildren. You should be a grandfather yourself about now. You have a pregnant daughter in Seattle, don't you? Any day now. My wife's out there for the occasion. And there's a reaction. I, I know we say it all the time in the cinephiles, but reaction shots are so important. And this one is like, oh, we know what we're actually talking about here. I've thought many times of calling you. I wish you had. And now, what you know what should we talk about? Sybil the soothsayer. <laughs> and that thing about the craggy middle-aged man, and she could have gone to Sybil and say, hey, that never happened. And Sybil said, don't worry, you will. And we talk about that one night they spent together, and she asks, are we going to get involved, Max? And he grabs her, and he turns, and with just tremendous vulnerability, I think, from an actor like William Holden, he says, yes, I need to become involved very much. There's a lot in there, mm. you know, a lot of pain and loneliness and loss and the end of his career and the the lack of passion in his marriage and the near his friends dying and Howard Beale going nuts and a lot there. Cast because he had sad, sad eyes. Sad mm-hmm. eyes. Exactly right. Now we go to Diane at work, negotiating on the phone and then hanging up and heading off. And then there is this montage of scenes, which I believe... If you were to remove the dialogue, this is a perfectly classically romantic montage. He, she runs into the car where he's waiting and kisses him passionately. They are walking hand in hand on the beach. They are sitting in a restaurant. She has his hand on her face, which she kisses repeatedly while staring lovingly in her eyes. Mm-hmm. They run through the wind to the inn where they're staying hand, holding hands. They go the sea into, spray in. The yeah. sea spray <laughs> in. They run into this room. They are quickly... Uh, undressing in a beautifully romantically lit scene. They go into bed naked, they make love, and they lie together in the bed naked. Mm -hmm. So if you knew nothing else, (laughs) that sounds like a classic romantic sequence from a romantic film. Mm. Except (laughs) that she is talking a mile a minute. He doesn't say anything about network television and scheduling and development and stars and negotiations until (laughs) finally achieving (laughs) orgasm while talking about the time slot. All I need is six weeks federal litigation and the Mount St. Jonah can start getting its own time slot. (laughs) It's crazy. It is. (laughs) 
<laughs> he said this is the only thing she does really well uh, is television. Yeah. So she found a way to, to connect it with her love life. Well, and she had even described exactly how she was in the sack. Right. <laughs> and now she demonstrates, yeah, yeah. it seems pretty much it. And by the way, I think both of their performances are really brave in this mm. scene. Mm. For William Holden to be treated, you know, he's a big yeah. movie star. Yeah. And to be an accessory throughout this whole thing and not even really respected romantically in a way. And then for Faye Dunaway to be naked and sexual, mm -hmm. but in this completely cold and yeah. weird mm. and funny way. It's crazy. Sequence. Well, she comes off as such a dominant, dominating mm -hmm. character, mm -hmm. and he, as you say, the big movie star, is so weak, and so so, weak. So, so so unable to cope and with his own feelings as well as the situation. Well, and you you kind of go like the wheels must be turning in his head of just like, what am I doing here? Yeah. What have I gotten myself into? Schmuck. What Schmuck. Are you into? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, uh, and now we get to meet his wife. Well, see his wife again. See, uh, yeah, we see. Yeah, we met her. This is Beecher Strait. Yeah, I'd seen this movie a lot. This scene is, I it it never wrecked me quite as much. Now, and I watch it multiple times. Mm -hmm. Um, and each time I was just weeping. I mean, and maybe because I'm, I'm older, I have multiple friends who've been through divorces. I I've been married for twenty plus years. I know some of this. You know, like this mm -hmm. felt really real. Um. Another just directorial technique with uh, this scene before we get into it. So they do the scene and they'd already rehearsed it. And in a ways, this is kind of the opposite of what we heard before. And Sidney Lumet said to Beatrice Strait, let's do it again, more. And we do it again. And he goes, no, not enough. Do it more, louder, bigger. <laughs> and they do it again more and it keeps getting bigger. And now they're on take. Now Sidney Lumet rarely does more than three takes because he knows what he wants and he gets it. He's rehearsed it. And he's very, very clear in what he wants. Very efficient. Now they're on take five, they're on take six. And she's huge now. And Patty Chayefsky runs up to him and says, Sydney, this is way too big. It's way too big. It's all wrong for the scene. And Sydney says, Patty, you know comedy. I know actors. Mm. You let me do what I'm doing. And he did seven takes. He did eight takes until finally she was so exhausted from all of this stuff. And then he goes, okay, let's go again. And that's the take in the movie. And that probably won her the award. Oh, yeah. So... You know, trust your director sometimes. So, I mean, if it's sitting in the mat, it's sitting in the mat. Absolutely. Yeah. She's incredible in this film. You know, it's the one scene my girlfriend stopped and came into the, the room mm -hmm. to watch. She heard it start, heard the band came in and watched it with me. And she was, the, she was, that's, in, that's, now that's an incredible scene. The hurt. Yeah. Oh. And, and you see that Max starts off with the prepared speech. Yeah. You know, kind of saying, oh, I thought it was just an infatuation. Uh, you know, I thought it was menopausal, you know, late, mm -hmm. whatever it is. And then he says, but there's no sense in saying I won't see her again because I will. And it says, would you like me to check into a hotel? And she asked the important question. Do you love her? And there's a look from him and he says, I don't know how I feel. Mm -hmm. And then he says, I'm grateful I can feel anything. And the reaction from her in that moment. Oh, the hurt. Yeah. The physical, she just goes yeah. down like she's been shot. Yeah. Like, how dare you? Yeah. yeah. Like, I, like, because it's that's a condemnation of their entire of course. marriage. 20 years, her. whatever it's been. Yeah. I know I'm obsessed with her. Let's say it. Don't keep telling me that you're obsessed, that you're infatuated. Say that you're in love with her. And there's a pause. I'm in love with her. And she, the, what's amazing about her performance is that it is vulnerable and painful and angry and hurt and strong and fierce and powerful all at the same time yeah because after 25 years of building a home and raising a family and all the senseless pain that we have inflicted on each other i'm damned if i'm going to stand here and have you tell me you're in love with somebody else and what's interesting about this whole monologue is it stays on max mm -hmm. she's actually out of frame we see her legs in the background um, and, and she kind of says, look, this isn't one of those secretaries or like girl you had after a couple of belts of booze, which means, by the way, that those existed. Right. Because this isn't a convention weekend with your secretary, is it? Or, or some board that you picked up after three belts of booze. This is your great winter romance, isn't it? Your last roar of passion before you settle into your emeritus years. Is that what's left for me? Is that my share? She gets the winter passion and I get the dotage. Woof, woof. 
as as he shot her with one line, she decimates him with these. Yeah, yeah. So we have all this uh, important social stuff we've been talking yeah. about, and polit- politics, and, and the the the. the uh, ironies of the economy and the way it affects uh, the news business and all that sort of stuff. And here's this just incredibly intimate human mm-hmm. moment yeah. that is so powerful. I'm your wife, damn it! And if you can't work up a winter passion for me, the least I require is respect and allegiance. Even she's telling him, don't bullshit me. Yeah. Mm. No I'm, more bullshit. I get, I te- no more I get bullshit. tears in my eyes right now right. just saying those lines. Yeah. I, at least I require is respect and allegiance. Mm-hmm. But then she says... I'm not going to give you up easy. She re- she like reverts. Yeah. She comes back to her spine. Them New York ladies, man, they're built to steal. That spine <laughs> of hers. And she just says like, I'm not going to give you up easy. This is going to be a fight. LA ladies wow. are built to steal too. No, oh, fair, fair. <laughs> well, sure. and, the, and the line after that is, I'm not going to give you up easy. Yes, I think you should check into a hotel. Right. That's fascinating too. Mm-hmm. I'm going to fight for you, but you can't stay here. Right. Which means she's maintaining her strength on some level. Mm-hmm. The other moment is that after all this speech of strength and power, she says, I hurt. <laughs> I hurt. Don't you understand that? I hurt badly. <laughs> and he's standing there looking at, each, at her and she says, don't you have anything to say? And after a long considering pause, he says, I've got nothing to say. So Karen and I stopped the movie at this point. Mm. And she your wife, an, Karen, your wife, my wife, Karen, Karen sorry. Uh, and she had an entirely different interpretation of I have nothing to say than I did. Mm-hmm. What do you think it means when he says I have nothing to say? Because nothing he says will matter in this moment. Uh, so he hugs her. That's what she wants. And that's what he, from 25 years of marriage, knowing her, or obviously more than 25 years, they were just married for 25 years. He knows exactly what she needs in this moment and he hugs her and he gives her that solace. Whatever he said would have meant, wouldn't have meant anything. I think he's finally admitting he's confused. Mm. He doesn't know. There yeah. isn't anything he can say. Mm. It's so funny. It's the same problem he had with trying to reconcile the mm. desire for the audience with the news right. product mm. that he wanted to produce. It's funny. Mine's similar to yours, but mine was sort of, I have nothing to say because everything you just said is true. Mm -hmm. I agree with everything. Karen said that it was a total failure on his part, that he wasn't able to articulate his, him saying, I have nothing to say was saying, I don't have love for you, Mm -hmm. you know, and that I'm just, I'm too cowardly to say Mm -hmm. anything. And so I'm just going to hug you in this sort of awkward, which it is a somewhat awkward I mean, how again, how we interpreted mm. silences and actions within a film is, you know, a really complicated thing. And it's so great. I'm so glad Karen and I stopped to talk about it because, oh, they, I, we can't know what's really going on in there. But I think I agree with Karen because it, it's once again, it's, a, it's an admission by him of his weakness and inability to deal with the circumstances that he's in. It's also a lesson for you. Don't be silent with Karen. Ever. It's fair. <laughs> that speak. That Always a, speak to her. That is good advice, my friend. Um, um, and then she asks, does she love you? And his response is, I don't think she's capable of love. Mm. Which, boy, from everything we've seen, yeah. that seems to be the case. And he describes her as TV generation. She grew up with Bugs Bunny. And, of course, I'm TV generation by that definition. Mm. Then we go into this thing that has become a theme th- throughout the rest of the film in terms of their relationship, which is describing the relationship as scripts in TV mm. terms. And, again, this goes to the poetry of the movie. He says, Oh, my God, look at us, Louise. Here we are going through the obligatory middle of act two, scorned wife throws peccant husband out scene. But don't worry, I'll come back to you in the end. All of her plot outlines have me leaving her and coming back to you because the audience won't buy a rejection of the happy American family. It's such a weird description. And then his last line, which is just hilarious. She does have one script in which I kill myself. An adapted for television version of Anna Karenia, where she's Count Vronsky, and I'm Anna. <laughs> <laughs> that is just... <laughs> and so even in uh, the heavy scenes, Patty Chavsky is still funny. Yeah. Yeah. Here's an interesting thing. In the script, this scene comes before the non-romantic montage of the car, the beach, and the restaurant, and the sex. Mm. And then in editing, they reverse them. Yeah, smart. Huh. 
which they absolutely have to yeah. because because what would ha if you went to try to do the comedic scene with the ridiculous Diane talking work during sex scene after this yeah. heart wrenching scene yeah. it would be terrible mm -hmm. because that's him going like oh this is okay after I just you would hate Max yeah you it would ruin the character so Chayefsky went along with that with obviously absolutely. he did with, with the uh, switching of the scenes he was in the editing room and went nope you're totally right let's switch it uh -huh. um, and it's much much better yeah I agree. Um, because then we go to another ridiculously funny scene, which is the negotiation with the great Ahmed oh, Khan. <laughs> Eating the fried chicken. <laughs> and, this is, <laughs> and this is Lance Hendrickson is sitting in a blue suit, and we have a whole bunch of lawyers from management companies and network companies trying to negotiate the contracts, and they're just spewing out this language <laughs> <laughs> that is just the most ridiculous legalese. Dog, fuck with my distribution costs. I'm making a lousy 215 per segment. I'm already deficiting 25 grand a week with Metro. I'm paying William Morris 10 percent off the top, and I'm giving this turkey 10,000 per segment, another five for this fruit cake. And Helen, don't start no shit with me about a piece again. I'm paying Metro 20 percent for all foreign and Canadian distribution, and that's after recoupment. And out comes Walter Cronkite's daughter, who's the Patty Hearst character, with a machine gun, arguing with Lorraine Hobbs, and the great Ahmed Khan pulls a gun and fires it, scaring the crap out of our executives. And then he says, Man, give her the fucking overhead clause. <laughs> and then refers to some other thing. Page 22. Page. Let's go back to page 22. <laughs> I just love her when she says, don't fuck with my distribution. And you're like, oh, man. This, this, she understands. <laughs> well, this is, the, I mean, the, this is the, according to the film, the corruptive nature of television and money. Um, we're at a big affiliate meeting and there's some raw, raw stuff about Diane and the shows that are coming out. And then, uh, uh, Hackett gets a message and he walks off the stage, goes into some back room where somebody is watching the Howard Beale show, which has just started in the foreground. And another thing to point out is every time we see the Howard Beale show, we see it differently. So the first time we shot in a big glitzy watch on the TV and we're seeing kind of the show. This time we're seeing the show, but we're seeing it on a tiny little 19 inch TV screen in the foreground while other stuff is going on with Hackett in the background. And again, this is Patty Chayefsky's greatness of we're, we're not going to just show you one thing. We're going to have one thing informed by another thing. And so we see Hackett taking this phone call while Howard Beale is talking about this big business deal that's going on, which is basically boils down to the Arabs are trying to buy out CCA, which is the company that owns UBS, the network that they're on, and that he wants them to stop this. And of course, Hackett is on the phone talking back east to someone who is furious about this, and he doesn't even know what's happened yet because they're on the West Coast and it's three hours later. And so he finally kind of figures out what's going on, comes over to watch the TV, realizes what's happening and that this is going to destroy his corporate life. And then we cut to our main characters in a screening room watching the final tape where Howard Beale is asking his audience to write telegrams to the White House to stop the CCA deal. And he, he actually uses the same sort of syntax as he did in the I'm Mad as Hell speech. Of, I want you to get up now. No, I want you to get up now. I want you to get up out of your chairs. I want you to get up right now and go to the phone. I want you to get up from your chairs, go to the phone, get in your cars, drive into the Western Union offices in town. I want you to send a telegram to the White House. Oh my God. By midnight tonight, I want a million telegrams in the White House. I want them wading knee deep in telegrams at the White House. I want you to get up right now and write a telegram to President Ford saying, I was mad as hell and I'm not going to take this anymore. I don't want the banks selling my country to the Arabs. I want the CCA deal. Stop now. I want the CCA deal. Stop now. Come on. I want the CCA deal. Stop now. And this just wrecks all of our main characters in this room. Um, it's interesting too. I was thinking about the um, treatment of the Arabs in this scene. The Arabs are buying up America. The Saudis. The Saudis. Specifically. Yeah. Man. Is that, but this was the feeling about the Japanese in the 80s, and this is the feeling mm -hmm. about the Chinese today. You could just substitute it out. Right. It's the same, same emotional thing. Mm -hmm. And they ask for the room, and the sort of technicians go out. And the first thing we want to find out is this really true? Yeah, it's really true. Well, maybe Howard Beale doesn't have much power. He's like, oh no. They've already filled the White House with telegrams. Any second that phone's going to ring and Clarence McElhaney's going to tell me Mr. Jensen wants me in his office tomorrow morning so he can personally 
chop my head off. Four hours ago, I was a sun god at CCA. Mr. Jensen's hand-picked golden boy, the heir apparent. Now, <laughs> I'm a man without a corporation. <laughs> and they go, well, maybe Mr. Jensen won't care. He's like, no, no, Mr. Jensen's going to want to fire Howard Beale. And Diane's like, Why, how would he do that? Maybe unhappy, but he isn't stupid enough to withdraw the number one show in television out of peak. Two billion dollars isn't peak! That's the wrath of God! And the wrath of God wants Howard Beale fired! What for? Every other network will grab him the minute he walks out the door. He'll be back on the air for ABC Joe, tomorrow and we'll lose 20 I'm points. I'm going to pale the son of a bitch with a sharp stick through the heart! 40 million loss in revenues for the year. I'll take out a contract. And let's not discount federal I'll action by the Justice killers. Department if CCA no, I'll do it pulls Beale off the air as an act of retribution. I'll That's strangle him with a... Duval apparently this is almost all one take from him. Oh wow! And he is like a caged tiger oh, yeah. back and forth, and it is funny and it is angry. And at the very end of the scene, what does he start talking about? I'm going to hire killers. We're going to kill him, and he goes yeah. on a big speech about killing Howard Beale, which I don't think is serious yet. yet. <laughs> <laughs> And what the big thing he's talking about is, I know I'm going to get a phone call from Mr. Jensen that I have to show up. And of course, the phone rings. It's Mr. Jensen. And he does have to show up with Howard Beale. Right. It's the, it's the next morning. We are walking up some steps, which, by the way, is the steps of the uh, New York Library. And they go up into the boardroom. And there's Ned Beatty. And Ned says, Good morning, Mr. Beale. They tell me you're a madman. Only dizzle to relieve. How are you now? I'm as mad as a hatter. Who is it? I started as a salesman, Mr. Beale. I sold sewing machines and automobile parts, hairbrushes and electronic equipment. They say I can sell anything. I'd like to try to sell something to you. And he brings him into the boardroom. So here's the thing about Ned Beatty. Mm -hmm. He is not the original actor. They had another guy. They had him in the rehearsals. Lamette didn't think he could do it. He was desperate. They were in the middle of shooting. He's having lunch with Robert Altman. Robert Altman says, I got the guy for you. Recommends Beatty. Beatty's hired four days before. Wow. He learned this speech on the plane. He shot the scene, the first scene in the boardroom where he says, you know, good job. Day one. This is three days after he got the script. Walks into that boardroom. He is freaked out when he sees how they want to do it. Most of what we see in this scene is take one. Wow. Jeez. Whoa. Yeah. Also an Academy Award nomination right. for yeah. one scene. And he lowers the lights and he closes the curtains and he sets the stage with Beale on one side of the long table and him on the other. And then he goes into a performance. You have meddled with the primal forces of nature, Mr. Beale, and I won't have it. Is that clear? You think you merely stopped a business deal. That is not the case. The Arabs have taken billions of dollars out of this country, and now they must put it back. It is ebb and flow, tidal gravity. It is ecological balance. It is an old-time preacher, and the old-time preacher goes at him with a new philosophy, and the philosophy is... You are an old man who thinks in terms of nations and peoples. There are no nations. There are no peoples. There are no Russians. There are no Arabs. There are no third worlds. There is no West. There is only one holistic system of systems. One vast and imane, interwoven, interacting, multivariate, multinational dominion of dollars. Petrodollars, electrodollars, multi-dollars, Reichmarks, rims, rubles, pounds, and shekels. It is the international system of currency which determines the totality of life on this planet. That is the natural order of things today. That is the atomic and subatomic and galactic structure of things today. And you have meddled with the primal forces of nature. And you will atone. <laughs> and I love the switch where he goes, Am I getting through to you, Mr. Beale? <laughs> there is no America, there is no democracy. There is only IBM and ITT 
and AT&T, and DuPont, Dow, Union Carbide, and Exxon. Those are the nations of the world today. This is, according, apparently, this is Patty Chayefsky's philosophy of what's really going on in the mm. world. Huh. And his performance, Beatty's performance, and you see Beale, again, very similar lighting to when he lay on the bed and was talking to God. He's in this small spotlight, looking in just rapt astonishment at this man. And then he slowly starts walking towards him. And now we've gone from a wide lens where there's a lot of size change and we really see the shape of the room into a long lens where things are compressed and becomes more and more compressed as he walks through the shadows behind each of these lights. So it becomes almost this ethereal presence sort of floating through the space, not quite visible as he goes through and talks about what the world is today. The world is a business, Mr. Beale. It has been since man crawled out of the slime and our children will live, Mr. Beale, to see that perfect world in which there's no war or famine, oppression or brutality. One vast and ecumenical holding company for whom all men will work to serve a common profit in which all men will hold a share of stock all necessities provided, all anxieties tranquilized, all boredom amused. And I have chosen you, Mr. Beale, to preach this evangel. And Beale says, why me? And he says, because you're on television, dummy. <laughs> I have seen the face of God. You just might be right, Mr. Beale. To walk onto a movie set, deliver one monologue, and dominate like that. And here's the thing. Uh, the first movie John and I did that had Ned Beatty was Deliverance. Mm -hmm. That oh. was his first film ever. Wow, really? That's 1972. Yeah. That's 72. This is 76. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Again, the guy's still working today. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and you look at, like, if you just take his character Deliverance, his character yeah. Network, yeah. and then his character in Superman. In Superman which is two years later. Which is right. two years after this. Yeah. Like, that's amazing <laughs> what this guy can do. Yeah. And again, this is, I watched that scene and I went, I want Patty Chayefsky to look at today. Because instead of AT&T and IT&T and DuPont and Dow, we have Facebook, Google, Apple, and Amazon hmm. as those. And, and what they are selling, it's not actually, I think, the grand society of dollars and cents. It is minutes. It is how do you sell people? That is, seems to be the question of today, that, face, that the products have become us, and Facebook and Google in particular are selling us. Once again, the prescience yeah. of... Podichievsky, you don't have to have him come in now and tell us about it. He's already done it. That's mm. a fair point. Mm. It's the next show, and Howard Beale comes out big and says, hey, you did it. You stopped this deal, and it was amazing, but I guess that's it, folks, <laughs> because really there's no democracy, and he preaches this very sad, depressing thing. He says, because this is no longer a nation of independent individuals. It's a nation of some 200-odd million transistorized, deodorized, whiter-than-white, steel-belted bodies, totally unnecessary as human beings and as replaceable as piston rods. Mm. Mm. That is rough. Yeah. And again, the way it's filmed, now the camera is behind Howard Beale, slowly circling. We don't even see his face as he sits on the stage laying out the most depressing <laughs> evangel in history. The time has come to say, is dehumanization such a bad word? Because good or bad, that's what is so. The whole world is becoming humanoid, creatures that look human but aren't. And Diane is on the phone yelling at Howard's agent because the ratings are going down, according to our narrator. Um, and she, I love that she's almost standing on her bed screaming and in walks Max and they have an argument that is brutal and sad. 
Uh, and she's angry at him for having a morbid middle-aged mood, and he's tired of finding her on the phone and tired of being a, being an accessory, which is fascinating because you got to wonder how his wife has felt mm. for the last 25 years. Mm. Uh, you know, he's probably made her feel like an accessory. And he, I love that he's tired of writing a book about the great early days of television, and mm. that's another phrase that gets repeated. Every goddamn executive fired from a network in the last 20 years has written this dumb book about the great early years of television. And nobody wants a dumb, damn, goddamn book about the early days of television. William Holden does a really nice kick, yeah. I'd say, for a guy in his mid-60s to kick all his papers. Um, and then, man... I went to visit my wife today because she's in a state of depression. So depressed that my daughter flew all the way from Seattle to be with her. And I feel lousy about that. I feel lousy about the pain that I've caused my wife and my kids. I feel guilty and conscience stricken and all of those things that you think sentimental, but which my generation calls simple human decency. Now he's really going to bear his soul, William Holden, that there's real primal doubts going on, real mm -hmm. fear, real sadness and real, and he has real need and she's the person that's supposed to love him and she's not there for him. When they did the rehearsal, this scene did not go well. And William Holden had never done rehearsals before. And as Lamette is watching him, he goes, you know what I notice? Holden's never looking Faye Dunaway in the eye. He's always looking away. And he went, I think this scene is too true for him. It's too much what he's experiencing in his life. So instead of continuing to rehearse, what Lamette does is he stops rehearsal. He said, that's good. Let's stop. We'll get it on the day. On the day... They got the cameras all set up and he goes up to Bill Holden and he says, Bill, whatever you do, you cannot, you have to look Faye Dunaway in the eye, the whole scene. You cannot look away. And he goes to Faye Dunaway and she says, whatever you do, you have to look Bill in the eye, the whole scene. And suddenly all of that truth that he felt William Holden had been hiding from, all of that truth he was really feeling poured out in this mm. speech. And that thing that you mentioned too about his sad eyes, boy. Yeah. Mm. In this scene, it's right. The vulnerability, you never expect an actor like William Holden to show this. And boy, he does. Because I'm beginning to get scared shitless. Because all of a sudden it's closer to the end than it is the beginning. And death is suddenly a perceptible thing to me with definable features. You're dealing with a man that has primal doubts, Diana. And you've got to cope with it. I'm not some guy discussing male menopause on the Barbara Walters show. I'm the man that you presumably love. I'm part of your life. I live here. I'm real. You can't switch to another station. The great ones when they age are even more magical to watch because there's so much weight to their words. Sinatra with his singing as he got older, mm. after the two alleged attempted suicides, the loss of Ava Gardner, the songs, as, as he starts to lose people in his life, the songs, the melancholy of the reprise years at the end, there's so much mm. in that as men or as humans to devour and teach you things. Uh, Olivier, after the loss of like the confidence as an actor that he later mm. in life, to come back in the mid seventies himself and have his renaissance as an actor when he speaks about acting in such a different way than he did before when he was writing the arrogance of his talent. It's incredible to see that. I always find that to be fascinating as I get older to come back to those things and see those things in a whole new light than I did when I was in my twenties. And so I the actor is the actor's life experience. Exactly. It's that you're seeing in through. the performance. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think that's, that's one of the key to art. Sure. The key things yeah. to art is that if you need to tap into some truth within yourself in order to bring truth to the screen. Yeah. And and the thing he says to her is so desperate and so painful is is she asks him, what exactly is it you want me to do? And he says, I just want you to love me. I just want you to love me, primal doubts and all. He says, you understand that, don't you? And there is a reaction from Faye Dunaway. And... By the way, there was supposed to be more in this scene. There was more dialogue. And she says, I don't know how to do that. And the phone rings. The phone. Mm -hmm. And she answers it. There are phones you should not answer in relationships, <laughs> by the way. And she answers it and she says, I'll, I'll be with you in a minute, Matt. Mm -hmm. <sighs> See? And that is a great callback. 
Hmm. Because remember when Max and her first started getting together, she picks up the phone, makes the call to end the the hanging out with whatever yes. guy. So yes. she can be with Max. At this, she's That's like, uh, Max, you have to wait I hadn't on. thought about that. That's, yeah, that's a totally it's, great point. The yeah. phone now totally is more point. important than he is. And uh, now we're back at work and Lorraine Hobbs is mad because Howard Beale used to be a good lead in and now yeah. it's not a good lead in. <laughs> and we're down in some screening room and she's looking for replacement preachers and none of them are going to work. And we get into this question of, you know, we're either gonna, we're not going to replace Howard Beale. We're either going to keep him or we're going to go without him. And keeping him is a bad idea. And they're meeting with uh, Hackett and going, look, we should dump Howard Beale. That's, you know, I got audience research that says that the, you know, Lorraine Hobbs and the Vox Populi and the Sybil, they're all going to do okay. They've got good followings. We just got to dump him. But Mr. Jensen, Ned Beatty, he's <laughs> taking a liking to Howard Beale. <laughs> and Hackett goes, look, I'm going to go meet with him. I'm going to, I'm going to try my best and get him to dump him because I agree with you. And let's, and I love that he says, is 10 o'clock convenient for everyone? And he just walks out the door. <laughs> he doesn't actually wait for an answer to the question. And Diane comes back home and finds Max asleep and she goes upstairs. And this is where the lighting has become extremely dramatic. We're not in realism at all anymore. Mm -hmm. It is totally like, so realism exists is that if you have a light source in a room, then even though you're hanging all sorts of uh, artificial lights, if there's a window or there's a light, then you're matching the light coming from those places. We're not doing that anymore. The light is coming in pools of light to light dramatically what we want to light, regardless of what the light sources in the rooms are. And we're upstairs and she is packing Max's bag. I think that time has come to reevaluate our relationship, Max. So I see. And again, we go back to the script. I don't like the way this script of ours is turning out. It's turning into a seedy little drama. Middle-aged man leaves wife and family for young heartless woman goes to pot. The Blue Angel with Marlena Dietrich and Amy Yarnings. I, I don't like it. So you're going to cancel the show. And finally, he takes over doing the luggage, and she apologizes, I guess, for some of the fights last night. I love she says, Sorry for all those things I said to you last night. You're not the worst fuck I've ever had. Believe me, I've had worse. And his line is so funny. Again, it's the humor in the midst of drama. He says, Why is it that a woman always thinks that the most savage thing she can say to a man is to impugn his coxmanship? <laughs> um, that's a great line <laughs> um, and I mean I wonder has makes anyone you, makes your face red doesn't it has, <laughs> any, has anyone in the history of the universe ever used the term impugn his coxmanship before Patty Chayefsky came know, up with this I mean I'm going to use it from now on yeah right <laughs> um, and we're downstairs and he says I knew this was over over a week ago will you go back to your wife I'll give it a try, but I don't think she'll jump at it. And then he says he's concerned about her because she's not a boozer, which means she's just going to crack or jump out of mm -hmm. her window. And as he says this, she goes into the kitchen and takes out a cup and a saucer to make herself some coffee or tea, and her hand is shaking, and then there's this force of will she uses to put it down and get herself back together. So... I was looking through the script, and as I said, Patty Chayefsky also has beautiful descriptions, and I wanted to read this to you because it is literally exactly what's on the screen. She fetches a cup and saucer from the cupboard and would make some instant coffee, but she is overtaken by a curious little spasm. Her hand holding the cup and saucer is shaking so much she has to put them down. With a visible effort, she pulls herself together. That is... Mm exactly what we see on the screen. And then because of her effort to pull it together, she comes at him screaming. I don't want your pain. I don't want your menopausal decay and death. I don't need you, Max. You now get need out of me. You need me badly because I'm your last contact with human reality. I love you. And that painful decaying love is the only thing between you and the shrieking nothingness you live the rest of the day. And don't leave me. She blurts out this honest, emotional moment. Then don't leave. She almost yeah. stops herself from finishing the sentence yeah. because she's One being time. so honest. Yeah. Well, and this I is where, yeah. simply the she has no vulnerability. <laughs> it's like, yeah. no, she does. She does. In that moment, she yeah. does. And then he says, You're one of Howard's humanoids. And if I stay with you, I'll be destroyed. Like Howard Beale was destroyed. Like Lorraine Hobbs was destroyed. Like everything that you and the institution of television touch is destroyed. And then this speech, man, you're going to rip a person up when you dump them. Check this out. 
Your television incarnate, Diana. Indifferent to suffering, insensitive to joy. All of life is reduced to the common rubble of banality. War, murder, death. All the same to you as bottles of beer. And the daily business of life is a corrupt comedy. You even shatter the sensations of time and space into split seconds and instant replays. Your madness, Diana. Virulent madness. And everything you touch dies with you. Hmm. Wow. And he says, but not me, not as long as I can feel pleasure and pain and love. And he kisses her. And there's a great reaction from her as he goes away. Um, and again, we go back to the script. And it's a happy ending. Wayward husband comes to his senses, returns to his wife, with whom he's established a long and sustaining love. Heartless young woman left alone in her arctic desolation. Music up with a swell. Final commercial. And here are a few scenes from next week's show. <laughs> this is poetry. Mm. Like, we've totally abandoned any kind of realistic way of speaking. We're speaking in perfectly mm. metaphorical poetic mm. terms. Using the mechanism of television, which is what the whole thing is about, to describe the emotions of the characters. And Holden delivers that. Ah. Oh, yeah. So powerfully. We're at our final meeting. Again, lighting incredibly dramatic. Everyone in their pools of light. Nobody moves in this scene. And we hear that Mr. Jensen doesn't want him fired. He likes him. Mr. Jensen feels we're too catastrophic in our thinking. I argued that television was a volatile industry in which success and failure were determined week by week. Mr. Jensen said he did not like volatile industries and suggested with a certain sinister silkiness Volatility in business usually reflected bad management. <laughs> Which is just like an executive would say. <laughs> I would describe his position on this as inflexible. Where does that put us, Diana? That puts us in the shit house. That's where that puts us. And then there's a discussion of ratings and how much ratings means in terms of money. And this is going to cost this, you know, $45 million a year or whatever it is. You guys want to hear all the flack I'm getting from the affiliates? We know all about it, Herb. And you would describe Mr. Jensen's position on Beale as inflexible? Intractable and adamantine. And then the other white haired guy whose name I don't remember says, So what do we do about this Beale son of a bitch? And Frank Hackett, with almost no emotion, says, Suppose we'll have to kill him. And what's amazing about this moment is there is a, a pause mm. and there is no reaction. Mm -hmm. And then he turns to Diana and says, I don't suppose you have any ideas on that, Diana. Well, what would you fellas say to an assassination? I think I can get the Mao Zedong people to kill Beale for us. It's one of their shows. Kill the lead in. <laughs> and kill, yeah. And what's amazing <laughs> to me about it is that that means she's already thought about this. Oh, yeah. This is not a new thought. It could be done right on camera in the studio. We ought to get a fantastic look in audience for the assassination of Howard Beale as our opening show. And she talks about the audience and they could make it the big kickoff of the season. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll do it right on camera. And then the only question is, well, what do we owe Beale for his contract? <laughs> and apparently his contract was based on last year's ratings, so it's probably not going to be very much. And now we cut, and this is totally bizarre in terms of filmmaking, in the midst of this scene, for no particular reason, we just suddenly cut to people walking into what we, we will find out is the Howard Beale show. Just a crowd of ordinary people walking through a lobby. And we start to hear about syndication rights and other network stuff. And there's one guy who says, jokingly, I hope you don't have any hidden tape recorders in this office, Frank. <laughs> a little, little Nixon reference. A little bit of Watergate reference. <laughs> and there's one moment where one of the guys says, We're talking about a capital crime here. And we think in this moment that he's going to offer the moral objection that mm -hmm. we assume someone's got to say, holy shit, what are you talking about? And then he just says, The network can't be implicated. So, oh, there's not going to be any moral objection here. And Frank says, well, the issue is, shall we kill Howard Beale or not? I'd like to hear some more opinions on that. Look, I don't see we have any option, Frank. Let's kill the son of a bitch. And then we cut to... We're 
the opening of the show, and it's the <laughs> Howard Beale Show and all the fanfare, and we introduce all our characters. And starring the mad prophet of the airways, Howard Beale. And then the music is swelling, and Howard Beale is walking forward, and then the music stops, and he is about to speak, and in a silence that is just long enough to be awkward, the great Ahmed Khan and the members of his force open fire, and Howard Beale drops dead. And what does the camera do? Pans in close. Pushes in yeah. just like it did on every other episode when yeah. he falls down. They know what to do. Yeah. It's a formula. Absolutely. And then we go into the same kind of quads lit that we opened the show, um, where at the beginning we saw the four anchors of the major networks, and now we see the news of the assassination of Howard Beale going by. And also playing on these is some nice commercials mm -hmm. for an airline, the Mikey He Likes It commercial for Life Serial. Mm -hmm. And we hear a little bit of information that the great Ahmed Khan escaped and the camera pushes in on Howard Beale left all alone. And we hear the narrator say, This was the story of Howard Beale, the first known instance of a man who was killed because he had lousy rating. <laughs> <laughs> and there's lots of talking and a teletype. And that is the end of our film. Yeah. And I love that ending moment because it shows you the truth is that We'll be shocked for a few seconds, but then a commercial will come on or something will distract us. And then eventually we move on to the next thing and the news cycle, which now is yeah. so rapid, yeah. which at that time in the 70s yeah. would last for a few days. Now is literally sometimes yeah. within the day, something takes the place and we move on from Almost what within we thought. a moment. I mean, yeah. It's coming so fast. Very and important. we also, I keep saying this, I don't know if we want to be political about it, but... Mm. Uh, President Trump is a guy who knows how to manipulate he's the, the system. Best. He's a genius. N nobody's ever been able to do that. I don't know, I don't know like if he's that. a conscious genius or uh, that's a good unconscious question. Yeah. genius. Yeah. But he's his, like Howard Beale. Is yeah. he true? Yeah. Is he, does he know what he's doing? I, I don't about? know. Yeah. But his ability to change the story or refocus right. attention on something else yeah. is is amazing. Almost minute by minute. It's just extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. Um well and and, and what he does, and much like some of the things is that the more extreme he makes it, the less we're able to focus on it because he does an extreme thing and we go, oh my God. Yeah. And just when we start to focus on that, something else. Mm. And we forget the policy implications, the, yeah. Yeah. the consequences down the road to what the ultimate outcome of whatever it is he's saying might be. The, the, there's a moment I was, I was a poli-sci major in, in school and I remember there's a moment from Eisenhower that I always think about, which is that they really didn't want him, there was something they didn't want the news to get a hold of or make a story on. And they said, well, what are you gonna do when they ask you this question? And he said, well, I'm just gonna confuse them with such crazy, terrible grammar that by the end they'll have no idea what I was saying. <laughs> And they'll just move on. And he gets on and he says something like, well, it's uh, number one, you have to do this, but B, and I love that just going from one to B, and then he goes off on just a completely. Wow. And people talked about whether he, in fact, had been affected by his heart attack in such mm. a way that he was not it's the wicked. same guy that he used to be. Wow. Yeah. Um, the movie gets somewhat of a mixed reception. So critically, there are some people said this is the greatest thing ever, and other people found it self-indulgent, preachy, self-righteous, scattered. Of course. Um, you know, which is, you know, to be expected. Sure. It was nominated for 10 Oscars, um, including editing, best picture, directing, cinematography, and he won four. And it just, this is a crazy year for Oscars. Mm. So for best picture, which it did not win, the nominations are Rocky, All the President's Men, Bound for Glory, Network, and Taxi Driver. Wow. I mean, that is a remarkable, wow. with the exception of Bound for Glory, which is a movie I've never seen, those are, uh, we've done every single other one of those mm -hmm. on the cinephiles. Mm -hmm. Those are, which isn't, that's not the ultimate standard for <laughs> no. <the> movie, <laughs> but, but Taxi Driver, Just All the Presidents Men and Rocky are fantastic films. For actor, it's uh, Peter Finch, who's nominated posthumously, Robert De Niro for Taxi Driver, William Holden uh, for this, so both actors are nominated, and mm. Sylvester Stallone. And Finch wins. Uh, supporting actor is Jason Robards for President's Man, Burgess Meredith for Rocky, Rocky yeah. uh, Lawrence Olivier for Marathon Man, yeah. and Burt Young for Rocky as well. Mm. And Jason Robards wins. But these are like remarkable categories. Yeah. Uh, uh, Faye Dunaway also won, Beatrice Strait also won. Uh, it did not win director or picture. Um, and the WGA ranks network as one of the top 10 greatest screenplays ever written. And there's currently a stage ad adaptation starring um, Brian Cranston. Brian Cranston, yes. which my mom saw in New York, and I think you were at a reading of it early there on. There was a reading of it in uh, the uh, in, at LACMA, mm. not 
all that long ago, and uh, I was the narrator. Oh, that's great. Uh, <laughs> that's great. That's great. Um, we're at the point where we normally give our final thoughts. Do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Uh, this film resonated with me seeing it recently because of everything that's going on in the world. I said at the beginning. But it is a film that needs to be uh, revisited by anybody who listens to it, who maybe you've haven't thought about it in a while, or maybe you 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 were like, oh, it's you know, it, it didn't affect me that much. I guarantee you, if you go back and watch it now, it'll have a lot to say to you. And depending on where you are in your life now, it'll have a lot to say to you about what you want to do, where you want to go, and maybe the bullshit that you're done dealing with in the world will be highlighted. What Howard Beale's talking about, but. Also, what the film shows you is uh, just because you're done with bullshit doesn't mean the bullshit is done with you. <laughs> and I think that's a really important thing to think about and uh, really focus on Ned Beatty's speech here because that is what we're moving into, where we are really becoming just numbers on a piece of paper. The individuality and the idea of us as a group and, and as a as a force in the world is starting to be taken away more and more by corporations as they employ us, make us apathetic and take away our inability to get uh, angry anymore and cause change. Uh, this is what uh, Ned Beatty's character is talking about as he does that whole speech to Howard near the end there, saying that it's not about nations or, or, or uh, peoples anymore. It's about corporations. And pretty soon, uh, as we see corporations do deals with it, and nations that do some pretty despicable stuff, you realize it is all about the money. And I wonder if there's an ending point. And it certainly doesn't feel like there is one when you come out of this movie from 1976 or when you walk out into the world in 2019. So for me, most of the time when we go to movies, we're doing exactly what Howard Beale says that we're doing, which is that they are in the entertainment business, mm -hmm. business the boredom killing business. And you know what? Having been around people making movies for a while now, that's a tough business. It's actually hard to make an entertaining film. But every once in a while, a film comes along which actually is in the deep truth business. Not the you know lowercase t truth, but the capital T truth. A truth that through its language and through its ideas is there to make you think, to make you re-examine the way the world works. And Howard Beale saying that he's mad as hell. Howard Beale talking about bullshit. Diane breaking down what is on TV. You know, going through their lives as scripts. Our description of humans becoming humanoids. The descriptions of Ned Beatty that the world has become a place without nations or democracies or peoples or ideologies, but a place that is run by dollars and cents. And what the meaning of our life is becomes into somewhat sharper focus the more you think about the movie of Network. Mm -hmm. And the poetry of it, the language of it, the passion of it, and the drive to tell this story that is unusual and profound from the mind of Patty Chayefsky makes this one of the most unique and special movies for me uh, in the history of film. You guys are so eloquent, and I hope you won't make mine the final comment because uh, I don't have anything as profound as that to say. But when I first saw this movie in 1976, uh, it really was revelatory to me in a way. It brought home to me what I had been doing as a television uh, person. And I stayed in the television business for some time after that, television news uh, business such as it was, uh, and sort of saw myself living out um, or experiencing some of the things that I'd seen in the film. For example, uh, I went to work for a station and I was told that uh, I would be the uh, credibility guy and that they'd never make me do anything that would embarrass me. Mm -hmm. And they never did. And I had at one point done this long uh, story about uh, Tom Bradley and his long years as the mayor of Los Angeles and he was about to run again and, you know, what, what, was, it, what was that all about? And it was quite a long piece for its time, you know, eight or ten minutes, something like that, which was practically endless. And it was scheduled to go on a particular show. And that day in Los Angeles, we had one of the uh, deluges that uh, L.A. is, and for some reason, not all that famous for, but we have them from time to time. And there was a rock on the top of a ridge uh, someplace in Orange or San Diego County. And geologists looked at it and said, this rock's going to go. Hmm. Right. It's going to come rolling down the hill. And it was at the top of a hill, and in front of it, uh, on the Pacific Coast Highway, was a row of houses. So everybody started to send their cameras down to this scene. And we would come back, we would hear, there it is, it's going to come down. And we're, and we're going to, well, we'd always promise before right. we're going to the commercial, we're going to be there live yeah. when this thing happens. On and on. 
this went. It's starting out at about one o'clock in the afternoon, something like that. And my long piece, you know, culmination of my career <laughs> as a political reporter is supposed to run. And we get into the news cycle and it's not coming up, you know, when it was supposed to come up. And we're back again, the same thing, over and over again. Right. It's much more important to watch a rock to rolling a rock. down a hill. Yeah. So uh, time goes on, and I'm thinking, you know, this is going to be on the 11 o'clock news if I'm lucky. And all of a sudden, I look up at the uh, monitor, and it b breaks loose. Hmm. And it comes bounding down the hill. It's the size of a Volkswagen. Disappears behind one of the houses and bursts out of the front of the house. Wow! And there's, uh, you know, wires and and uh, glass and uh, pieces of concrete and so on. It bounces into the road and across the street and into the uh, into the uh, water. And sort of at one moment, we all realized that ours had been the only station that was on live. And the voice of our news director came over the loudspeaker saying, "God." wants Eyewitness News to be number one. <laughs> <laughs> so, as I said, um, what I saw in 1976, I then saw being replicated again and again and again and again, and uh, what you say about... And, and the other thing that occurs to me is the role of the media in creating the situation that we are in today right. with this uh, uncertainty about what our values are and uh, are we, in fact, what Ned Beatty described us as being. Yeah. It's a very important message. Agreed. So that is what we think about network. As always, we want to hear what you think. You can visit us on our Facebook page, do a search for The Cinephiles. You can support the show by visiting patreon.com slash The Cinephiles, where you can suggest a movie or listen to our Cinephile shorts. Visit cinephiles.net to buy every movie that we've ever uh, <laughs> talked about. Um, and as always, you can reach me on Twitter at SR Morris and Instagram at SR Morris One. John, where can they reach you? You can always reach me at The Roca Says on Twitter and on Instagram. And as I said, the top 10 and both Geek Buddies, the, the Geek Buddies, those are all available on the other uh, uh, streaming platforms for podcasts. So go and listen to those two completely different podcasts than the Cinephiles, but uh, a lot of fun to do. Uh, so there you go. And um, Warren, uh, people want to find uh, To The Point is still available as a podcast? It certainly is. It went on as a broadcast, started out as a broadcast in 1980, uh, went along with uh, Which Way LA, and then we discontinued both of those. After quite a long time. Yeah. And uh, now we're doing To the Point as a podcast. We're doing two of them a week. We do one uh, on a particular subject that's of interest uh, in the news. And then we also have a climate change update that we're doing on a weekly basis, which has gotten a lot of audience. Oh, and wow. uh, and it's, uh, it's doing very well. You can find it at uh, wherever you get podcasts, of course. And uh, also directly at kcrw.com slash to the point. You can get me at warren.olney at kcrw.org, and I'd love to hear from you. Um, thank you so much for coming you, on the Warren. show. This has been I such a, a pleasure. Mm -hmm. I really, really enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, and I think that is it for this week. We will see you next time on The Cinephiles for another great film. <laughs>